The Pharmacist's Guide to Code Blue Emergencies, Part 2. In the first segment of this lecture on Code Blue medications, we talked about asystole and pulses electrical activity, or PEA. In Part 2, we're going to talk about the third major type of cardiac arrest, pulseless VTAC or VFib, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC, appears on the EKG as a waveform that looks like the edge of a saw. It's as though you took the regular EKG and widened it so that the QRS becomes the predominant feature of the waveform. Ventricular fibrillation, on the other hand, appears on the monitor as a wormy type of a waveform. It can either be coarse V-fib or fine V-fib. Epinephrine will convert fine V-fib into coarse V-fib, which is easier to convert to normal sinus rhythm. Here's the ACLS algorithm for pulses VTAC or V-fib. You'll notice that it is quite different from that of asystole and PEA. Once the arrhythmia is detected, a single electric shock is delivered, followed by intubation and establishing IV access. CPR is continued for two minutes, and then, if a discernible rhythm is not detected, a second electric shock is delivered to the patient. Epinephrine, one milligram IV push every three to five minutes is then administered, along with CPR for another two minutes. If a discernible rhythm is not detected, after this, then a third electric shock is administered, followed by antiarrhythmic administration, either amiodarone or lidocaine. Electrical defibrillation is a shock that resets the heart's electrical activity. It can either be given as monophasic or biphasic defibrillation with an initial dose of 360 joules for monophasic and 120 to 200 joules for biphasic. Subsequent doses for monophasic is the same dose, whereas biphasic you would use either the same dose or higher dose. In this diagram, you can see the difference between monophasic and biphasic defibrillation. Monophasic gives one big dose of electricity, which makes a single pass out of one pad to the other. Biphasic is much better technology. It uses a lower dose of electricity, which exits one pad, goes to the other, and then comes back again. This requires lower energy and causes less myocardial injury to the patient. One important point to note about antiarrhythmics is that they do not pharmacologically convert VFib or VTAC to an organized rhythm. That's the job of the electric shock defibrillation. Antiarrhythmics as drugs only facilitate the restoration and maintenance of a spontaneous rhythm in conjunction with the shock termination of the arrhythmia. Amiodarone is the first line antiarrhythmic agent to use in cardiac arrest. It is demonstrated in clinical studies to improve rates of ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, compared to lidocaine. However, there's no evidence that any antiarrhythmic drug increases survival to hospital discharge. It's very important to be familiar with the cold blue dose of amiodarone. The initial dose of amiodarone is 300 milligrams rapid IV push over three to five seconds. Then we need to follow with 10 to 20 mLs of D5W or NS in order to push the initial dose of amiodarone into the circulation. We can repeat the dose of amiodarone times one with 150 milligram bolus, which is half the initial dose, in three to five minutes. Then we can start a drip at 0.5 to one milligram per minute. We need to manufacture all doses in glass or Aviva bags. Plastic is okay, but it's stable for only one hour. Amiodarone is available as 150 milligram per 3 ml ampules or vials. Remember that 300 milligrams is equal to two amps or vials, which is six mLs. 
It's also very important to distinguish the code blue dose of amiodarone from the non-acute dose. The majority of amiodarone drips are started as non-acute dosing, for example, when you're treating atrial fibrillation. This dose is taken straight from the package insert. It's 150 milligrams IV piggyback over 10 to 15 minutes, followed by one milligram per minute drip for six hours, and then 0.5 milligrams per minute thereafter. Amiodarone has a very long half-life of 26 to 107 days. This is because it has a very large volume distribution and very high tissue binding. It's liver metabolized and eliminated via the bile. IV side effects of amiodarone are twofold. First, it can cause hypotension. Hypotension is not due to the drug, but due to vasoactive solvents that are in the solution, polysorbate 80 and benzyl alcohol. The second side effect of IV amiodarone is bradycardia. There are five long-term toxicities of amiodarone that are important to remember for patients that are on oral maintenance. The first one is bradycardia. The second, pulmonary fibrosis. The third, liver toxicity. The fourth, hypothyroidism. This is because iodine content that's in the drug blocks T4 to T3 conversion. You can see in the picture of the structure, chemical structure of the drug that iodine is part of the chemical structure. And finally, amiodarone can cause a characteristic blue-gray skin discoloration. Now let's talk a little bit about lidocaine. Lidocaine was once considered the gold standard, but now it's relegated to an alternative. This is because people question whether lidocaine is really impacting positive outcomes and they wanted to try something different. Now amiodarone is suggested as the first line agent, but lidocaine is still in the guidelines as an alternative. For the lidocaine dose, we will load the patient with one to 1.5 milligram per kilogram, which is usually 100 milligrams for most patients, equivalent to one pre-filled syringe. We would then rebolus with 0.5 to 0.75 milligram per kilogram every five to 10 minutes to a maximum bolus dose of three milligram per kilogram. Reboluses are needed because of alpha distribution. Alpha distribution half-life is eight minutes. And so with this alpha distribution, levels may go below therapeutic levels. We would then start a lidocaine drip initially at two milligram per minute or four milligram per minute, and then we would then reduce it to one to two milligram per minute maintenance. The beta half-life of lidocaine is 90 minutes or about an hour and a half. The elimination is through liver metabolism. The half-life can be increased in liver disease and CHF. And so in these cases, we need to reduce the drip to one milligram per minute. Lidocaine's therapeutic level is two to six micrograms per ml, and it's thought to be potentially toxic greater than six micrograms per mil. Side effects include seizures, CNS toxicities, such as agitation and confusion. Magnesium sulfate is often requested during code blue emergencies. So let's talk a little bit more about it. It's an important cofactor in regulating sodium, potassium, and calcium flow across the cell membrane. However, in randomized controlled trials, magnesium did not increase the rates of ROSC and did not improve survival to hospital discharge or neurologic outcome. So the routine use of magnesium for VFib or VTAC is not recommended by ACLS. However, per ACLS, we can consider using magnesium only for torsade de poids associated with long QT interval. You can see the arrhythmia for torsade in the diagrams below. The outline looks like a party streamer. 
The dose for magnesium in these cases is one to two grams IV or IV piggyback. In an emergency, we can give one to two grams of magnesium sulfate, but we have to remember to dilute it in 10 ml of D5W or NS. We can give it IV push, but give it slowly over five to 20 minutes. Here's a flowchart diagram of the ACLS algorithm for asystole or PEA. As you can see, CPR is administered continuously and a check is made every two minutes to see if ROSC is established or a shockable rhythm has developed. Epinephrine is given as soon as possible and at three to five minute intervals. For VTAC or VFib, the patient is immediately administered an electric shock. CPR is performed for two minutes. If the patient continues to have an arrhythmia, the patient is shocked again and given epinephrine. If after two more minutes, the arrhythmia persists, antiarrhythmic medication is administered. Here are some other code blue drugs. Sodium bicarbonate. The ACLS position on the use of bicarb is that routine use is not recommended. Sodium bicarbonate use was not associated with an improvement in ROSC or survival to discharge rates in cardiac arrest. In special resuscitation situations, ACLS says sodium bicarbonate may be beneficial. This would be for pre-existing metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, or tricyclic antidepressant overdose. Sodium bicarbonate use is still common during code blues. The dose is 50 MEQs, which is equivalent to one syringe. Sodium bicarbonate helps catecholamines, which do not work well in too acidic or too alkaline of an environment. It's incompatible with calcium chloride. It forms precipitate calcium carbonate, which is equal to chalk. So make sure to flush with saline in between administrations of sodium bicarbonate and calcium chloride. Atropine has been removed from the cardiac arrest algorithm since evidence suggests that it is unlikely to have a therapeutic benefit. The mechanism of action of atropine involves the vagus nerve that innervates the heart. The vagus produces parasympathetic or cholinergic influences which slows down the heart. Atropine is an anticholinergic, which will block vagal tone. However, in order for atropine to work, we need to hope the bradycardia is caused by a strong vagal innervation, vagal tone. The dose of atropine is one milligram IV push every three to five minutes for a maximum of three doses. When using a peripheral line compared to a central line when administering drugs, it can take one to two minutes for drugs to reach the central circulation. Therefore, when we administer drugs peripherally, we need to do two things. One, follow each drug dose with a 20 ml bolus of fluid, usually normal saline, and then elevate the extremity for about 10 to 20 seconds to facilitate drug delivery to the central circulation. Because it can be difficult to obtain IV access during cardiac arrest, intraosseous drug administration may be an alternative. The first attempt during cardiac arrest should always be for IV access. But if attempts at IV access are not successful or not feasible, intraosseous route of drug administration may be considered. Pooled analysis from three observational studies showed worse outcomes with the use of intraosseous access compared to IV for return of ROSC and survival to hospital discharge. Any ACLS drug or fluid that is administered IV can be given by the intraosseous route. The intraosseous route is preferred over the endotracheal route. For endotracheal drug administration, remember navel naloxone, atropine, vasopressin, epinephrine, and lidocaine as drugs that can be given using this route. 
The drug solution should be injected quickly down the endotracheal tube, followed by 5 to 10 rapid ventilations. The ET route results in variable and unpredictable drug absorption and blood levels. The typical endotracheal dose is 2 to 2.5 times the usual IV dose. We need to dilute the meds in 5 to 10 mL of saline or sterile water. For example, epinephrine 2 to 2.5 mg is diluted in 5 to 10 mL of NS or water and injected directly into the ET tube. The ET dose for lidocaine is 2 to 4 mg per kilogram. So to summarize, we reviewed the VFib VTAC ACLS algorithms. We described the use of the antiarrhythmics amiodarone and lidocaine, and we presented other drugs and routes of administration used during cardiac arrest. We've got a lot in store at the Farm Easy Tutor channel. There will be upcoming talks on management of heart failure, electrolyte management, quinolone side effects all about hospital pharmacy, anticoagulation, and much, much more. So please stay tuned to us. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEZ Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.